You're listening to 15 Minutes, where we feature community leaders sharing what the rest of us should know but likely don't. Hello, listeners. I'm Bala Musitz, the host of the 15 Minutes Share Your Voice podcast, where we talk with top-notch law firms and attorneys about what it takes to grow a successful law practice. This episode is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing, delivering tailor-made services to help your law firm accomplish its objectives and maximize your growth potential. To have a successful marketing campaign and to make sure you're getting the best return on your investment, your firm needs to have a better website and better content. Gladiator Law Marketing uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, and decades of experience to outperform the competition. To learn more, go to gladiatorlawmarketing.com where you can schedule a free marketing consultation. Today's guest on the podcast is attorney Anastasia Mazella. She is a partner at Cabotec LLP, a well-known boutique plaintiff's law firm in Los Angeles. Anastasia is a seasoned litigator who specializes in class actions, mass torts, complex personal injury, and child sex abuse cases against schools, districts, and churches. She also oversees the intake department at the firm and assesses the legal and economic viability of potential new cases. Welcome to the podcast, Anastasia. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, this is great. So can you tell us a little bit about the firm and what it does? Sure. Um, I think that we're unique in Los Angeles in that we take a wide variety of plaintiff's cases, Um, everything from... Uh, you know, complex personal injury to class actions to even some complex business litigation matters. Perhaps there's a, you know, a commercial or business case where um, they started off with hourly billable hourly attorneys and it's gone on for so long that they want to switch to some contingency work. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we do occasionally take hourly cases as well. So one thing we've learned is that the um, competition is stiff in Los Angeles. There's, you know, you can hit a plaintiff's attorney who does car accident cases, you know, just walking down the, the street, there's a million of them. So yeah. we really do have to evolve and grow and, and expand our horizons in terms of what we're aiming to achieve and kind of, you know, representing as many different types of people and cases as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a good point you bring up about a lot of competition. Uh, and and many attorneys are in markets like that where, where they're, you know, on attorney row and it's just, office after office of attorneys. How do you think about both differentiating the firm in that marketplace, but also differentiating yourself in that marketplace? That's a great question. I mean, definitely one way we differentiate ourselves is we don't focus in one particular area. I think people who know about us know, hey, if you've got that tough case, send it over to Cabotech because, you know, they have a small but really smart group of attorneys who aren't afraid to um, you know, tackle tough cases. We're not the kind of firm where, um, you know, let's just take a car accident, for example, um, you know, where there's, you know, you sue the other driver and you get their insurance policy. We're, we're not that kind of firm. We're the firm where usually another attorney has done that. And then mm. they feel like maybe there's another defendant, um, you know, maybe it was bad road design or, um, you know, maybe there was another car involved. And then they, you know, come to us and say, hey, we've already, quote unquote, popped the policy limits. Now, will you guys take over and try and do the harder type of litigation? Right. So that definitely differentiates us being known um, to take the hard ones. Yeah. So it also sounds like there's a a fair number of attorneys that will refer cases to you, maybe ones that are a little bit outside of their specialty. A hundred percent. I would say, you know, and I run the intake department and um, one of the reasons why I oversee a a lawyer, we have an intake attorney. And one of the reasons why we have attorneys doing intake is because we do get a lot of referrals from other attorneys. Um, A vast majority of the work that we get come from other attorneys. And so we want to have another attorney talk to them, speak their language, so to speak. Yeah. So when, when you think about, uh, you know, the, the incoming, the inbound things that come into the office, there's sort of one way to, to get, uh, I get in a car accident, you know, I go through, I'm aging myself now, the yellow pages, or I get <laughs> online, 
and you know, and I look for attorneys or I look for billboards and I, and I pick one or I, maybe I call a couple and then I pick one. But when having, when referrals come in from other attorneys, that's sort of a different process. That's sort of a, you know, a, establishing yourself as an expert in, in various different areas. Mm-hmm. How have you guys done that? Um, so one way is results driven. So, mm. you know, we get good results. Our managing partner, Brian Kavitek, has had a wonderful career, um, really big hits. He um, and we now we're some of the younger attorneys are all trying to become on, you know, we sit on boards on part of two different boards. We have another partner who's on a couple of boards where we, you know, put our name out there. They know about us. And when we do have big hits and we have had results, we promote them. In you know, most yeah. of the time it's things like the Daily Journal, kind of well-known legal publications. But now we are, you know, trying to do more social media promotion and you know, kind of advertising our our success. And I think that's probably the biggest way we we uh, put our name out there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So uh, the other thing is, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about: Do you have an area of expertise? I mean, you did mention that you sort of manage the intake department, so you know, trying to sort through that. Uh, but what other areas do you concentrate in? So um, I do a lot of class actions and mass torts. Um, mm. And so mass torts are basically, uh, they're usually personal injury cases, but you have, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, plaintiffs who are all injured by the same drug, by the same defendant in some way. And they each all have their individual cases and injuries. Um, those take a lot of management <laughs> in terms of managing a, a, a huge client base. Um, class actions, we do consumer class actions. So those are kind of waning a little bit. Most big companies have uh, class action waivers, which prevent people from suing them in mass. Um, catastrophic personal injury. And then I'm really trying to or have developed a, a niche in the sex abuse cases, sex abuse, mm. sex assault on school campuses and um, against clergy. Yeah. Now, uh, do a, a large percentage of these uh, go to litigation and trial or uh, what's sort of the, the breakdown of, you know, something comes in, let's say it's coming into your, your portfolio. Uh, how many of those are, you know, go to litigation and then also to trial? Um, hundred percent go to litigation almost make me mm. say a hundred percent. It's very difficult to resolve cases pre-litigation. And if you try and you make a pre-lit settlement, you know, pre-litigation demand. You're kind of putting out there what you think the case is worth because yeah. you have to put a number on that demand. Um, and then in terms of which, how many go to trial? Class actions and mass torts typically don't. Sometimes mass torts do. You have individual trials, but mostly they don't. Um, and I'm not. I don't consider myself a trial attorney in particular. I I consider myself more of a law and emotion and appellate attorney. Um, I do most of that work on my cases. Um, but occasionally we do have, you know, some cases that are going to go to trial. I have one that might go to trial in February, a sex assault Mm -hmm. case. So, um, you know, I would say a small percentage go to trial of my case. Yes. Okay. And, uh, when you talked about, um, sitting on boards and sort of engaging with the business community Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, you know, other not-for-profit organizations, just kind of getting yourself out there sort of face to face with people. Uh, who can then refer you or refer things to you. Uh, has that been one of the best ways for you guys to sort of promote the law firm and, and get incoming, incoming cases? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's, it's networking. Um, LA is a relatively small, but, um, community legal community. So, you know, um, And there's other networking functions and belonging to organizations. Um, you know, the plaintiff's bar kind of events. Um, I think some of the uh, younger attorneys in our firm do a lot of that sort of thing, but absolutely getting your name out there. I, I, we have a lot of people who speak on panels. Um, I'm trying to do more of that Mm, Yes. further along in my career. And I enjoy that going on podcasts. Um, our firm has a podcast as well. So, um, all of those ways I think are, are the best ways, you know, you, you get to know people on more personal level, as opposed to putting a bunch of generic commercials on TV yeah. boards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me, I, I'm always curious uh, when I talk to different people in different professions. So what, what sort of was the driving force to make you decide the, the legal profession? 
you know, it was more of a practical force. I don't want to say, oh, I had this, you know, I love to kill a mockingbird when I was a child. <laughs> you know, yes. I, it inspired me to be a lawyer. Love the book, but that's really not what it was. Um, yeah. Always been a strong writer, um, particularly in like rhetoric and, you know, argumentative mm. writing. Um, and I had a lot of people growing up telling me, oh, you should be a lawyer, you should be a lawyer. I didn't do it right away. I didn't go back to law school until I was 32 years old. Oh, okay. Um, so don't do the math. That'll tell you how old I am. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and it really was, you know, I've kind of just felt like I was stuck in these jobs where I wasn't meeting my full potential. And I thought, you know, I really need to have more of a year by year career. I need a, a plan, a five-year plan. So I kind of matured and I went to law. I chose law because it was mm. something that was always interesting to me. And I felt my skills were tailored to it. So. Yeah. You know, I, I have to say, that in in my career I've I've engaged with a lot of different law firms, and there's very there's there's not a lot of gender diversity at the partner level, mm -hmm. and and you're a partner, yes, and and so can you talk about that a little bit? Sort of what are the challenges? You know what what ha impact that has had on you? Sure, um, I think one of the biggest challenges was um, we're actually well. Biggest challenge was becoming a partner and being not only the only partner with children. Um, mm. There was a, a, another gentleman who has children, a partner, but I think the difference is a lot of times the male partners have stay at home wives. Yes. Uh, not all, but a lot at my previous firm and this firm, a lot of the male partners had stay at home wives. Yeah. Um, and not only was I the only female partner with children, I am still the only female attorney with children. So um, I think that's the biggest challenge. You know, you you pass, at least I did. I I chose to pass on taking on more cases and the potential to make more money because I did want to be more of a hands-on mom, no nanny. Um, so I think that's that's the biggest. You kind of see some of the male partners getting more money, bigger sure. cases, better cases, so that you're like, oh, kind of hurts, but you have to know you're you're doing it um, for your family. Yeah. Yeah. So finding that balance is one of the yes. one of the challenges, I, I think, in, in many professions. <laughs> right. Uh, where, where do you where do you sort of draw that line? And 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 some professions are extremely demanding. Mm -hmm. And and the amount of time is often that you can engage often is related to your ability to advance and and get compensated. Correct. Uh, Correct. So if if you were. Oh, let me ask this question first. Have you had some mentors in sort of your legal, you know, uh, history and, and how have, how have they helped and what have they done for you? Um, yes, I, my first, the first five years of my career, I was a uh, defense on the defense side. Mm, okay. And I, I specialized in law motion and appellate work. Our, my law firm had its own little department and all we did was legal research and, uh, briefs and things like that. And I had two attorneys there that were wonderful. My partner in charge of us, and then the senior partner in charge. Um, and they both really, really helped. I have a little bit of what's called imposter syndrome. So I never, and I still have mm. it, never felt like I was good enough, never felt like my work was what, what I wanted it to be, but they were great in teaching me, um, you know, valuable tips for becoming a better legal writer. And then just really encouraging me like, no, you got this, you can do this, you know, we yeah. Uh, taking me, you know, encouraging me to do seminars and giving me a lot of work that I felt was above my pay grade at the time, but it helped show me that I could do it. So yeah. they gave me a lot of responsibility very early on, and that was extremely valuable. Mm. And then now, of course, it, since I became a plaintiff's attorney, I would say our managing partner, Brian Capitec, has been a great mentor. And he's without, you know, his willingness to let me uh, be a mom and do what I wanted to do as a mom and for my family and advance in the law firm. He's very, he's been very flexible. Um, I wouldn't, I, I honestly wouldn't be a partner. I yeah. Be where I am. yeah. Have there, have there been some mentors you've had that are outside of the profession or at least outside directly your, you know, your employment uh, and, and leadership tree? Gosh, I, I hate to say this, but not really, not from a professional yeah. standpoint. Um, I've had a lot of, you know, my mom was a working mom and she mm. encouraged us to really go for it. So 
you know, she, she was a huge influence on me, but professional mentors, I'm not sure I had any okay. until I became a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was there a, a sort of turning point in your career where, where something happened or you got a particular case or, you know, you had some vision and said, okay, this, this is, this is, a, and then it resulted in a big turning point. Gosh, that's a good question. Um, can I list two things? Oh, sure. Of course. <laughs> Cause I've had kind of a long career, I guess at this point, 16 years, but, um, the first would definitely be when I had my first child, I was still at the defense firm and I, oh my gosh, I was billable hours. Um, I had transitioned a little bit to litigation. I had depositions in three different States mm -hmm. and I kept passing up those opportunities, giving them to a male attorney um, who didn't mind leaving his family for three or four days. Um, and while I was suffering there, that turmoil, I got a random email from a recruiter and it said, you know, Hey, there's this intake attorney position at a plaintiff's firm and it's nine to six, no litigation. And I said, oh, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to, and that mm. was Habitech. So that's how I, you know, and it was, that's a huge turning point. I went from defense to plaintiffs and it really helped kind of transition me into the plaintiff's world. Um, and then re more recently in the last couple of years, Brian and I have been uh, lead counsel, class counsel on a huge case here in LA uh, called Jones versus City of Los Angeles and involves the LA DWP utility. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of controversy. We were actually replaced. We replaced old class counsel. We were appointed by the court. And there's a lot of, you can look it up in the LA Times. There's a lot of uh, allegations of collusion. And it's been a very exciting, but very difficult case the last few years. Wow. Wow. So if, if someone who's listening to this podcast, uh, let's say, you know, is looking at you and they're saying, oh, wow, this is great. What a great role model Anastasia is for me. What sort of words of advice would you give someone? I would say that um, although I went back to law school, I guess as an older student, I would say that the law is a young person's game. Um, so it's, I think it's good to maybe get a year or two of work um, under your belt between graduating from college and going to law school, because mm. it is a very strenuous profession. And I think having that strong work ethic and being in an environment where, um, you know, you, you, you work hard and you kind of come to law school with that base is extremely important. I wouldn't advise um, going straight from college to law school. I think that that does a disservice really to yourself and, yeah. um, and then I also wouldn't advise going back to law school when you're, um, you know, too old or too much older when you've got family responsibilities, because it is a very difficult, um, you know, those first five years of your career, you're really grinding um, and you're going to miss out on a lot of social opportunities and, you know, your family, your marriage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think there's like that sweet spot maybe in the 20s where it's a good time to go. And then lastly, I think it's important. Um, to not let fear uh, hold you back. Um, you know, I know timing is everything, but sometimes opportunities pop up. And even if you're, you don't think you're prepared for them, um, you know, you should trust your instincts and, and go for it. Believe in yourself. I mean, I know I certainly passed up on things when, in my younger days of the yeah. career that I regret now because of mm. fear. Yeah. 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 The, the unknown is, uh, is always a challenge and, and people's, risk level uh, yes. of what they're willing to accept. It's different for everybody and there's no right or wrong. We got to figure out what works for you and, and your situation. But I can reflect back on my life and, and, you know, I can say I walked away from certain things because it wasn't the right time. And, uh, or I took certain things because it did feel like the right time, yeah. but those are sometimes challenging. I, I just, I just am always thankful that I have those opportunities. That is true. <laughs> right. That's a good way to look at it. That's a good yeah. Way. I'm thankful I have the opportunity and you don't have to accept every one of them. <laughs> right. Exactly. And if you don't accept when you can't look back and regret it, I think exactly. you have to just figure, you know, Hey, look, it happened for a reason. And as a result, all these other things, because I turned it down, I have all these other great things. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, what, uh, as you think about your career and how it's progressed, where, where, do, where do you, 
where, what's the next big step for you? What's the, what's your next big sort of, you know, thing you're striving for? You know, um, I really feel that my career is on an upswing. Um, mm. you know, I really, I think I'm getting more opportunities. Um, I think the next, I, I love working with the younger associates. I love, you know, passing on my knowledge to them. I love being available when they have questions and helping them think through problems. So, you know, I would really like to see myself do more of that, do more yes. speaking, maybe go back and teach some night classes, you know, be an adjunct professor. Um, you know, I think that that's kind of where I see the next phase of, of my career, really. Yeah, very nice. I can highly recommend uh, being an adjunct. I, I, I did that for many years and then actually ended up being a full-time professor uh, later in my career. And I, I got a lot of satisfaction out of that. So I would, in, I would encourage you if that opportunity presents itself to pursue it. Oh, well, that's so great to hear that you enjoyed that experience. That's, yeah. that's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, it was a lot of work, but I also learned a lot. I, you know, they always say, right, you know, watch one, do one, teach one. <laughs> yes. And when you're, and when you're teaching something, you, you really, that's, there, there were many topics that I, I really understood them after I taught them. And if I wouldn't have had that teaching experience, I wouldn't have had the insights that I did that then helped me in my career. Right. So, you know, there, there's, there was, it wasn't just for the personal satisfaction. There was knowledge that I gained from that experience that helped me in my career. So I think I, I highly, highly recommend that. Oh, that's so great. I definitely yeah. look forward to something like that. Uh, so is there, uh, I'm going to start wrapping up uh, here. Mm -hmm. So I have two more questions for you. Uh, if listeners want to find out more about you uh, and the firm, where's the best place for them to go to? Well, we have a website, uh, www.kbklawyers.com. Um, they could, we also have a very unique name, Cabatech. So yeah. K-A-B-A-T-E-C-K. -E so um, we're definitely on the web. And, um, you know, we have a good, a good uh, presence online. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that information gets into the show notes uh, so people can find it there. Uh, and also, uh, is there something that I haven't asked you that you would like to share with the audience? Um, no, I think that, well, let me think. Um, no, I think I've pretty much said it. I mean, my most important message is, um, you know, just go for it. Fake it yeah. till you make it. If you, if you believe in something and you really want something in your career, you know, don't let anything hold you back. Uh, certainly experience helps, um, but you get that along the way. And like you said, you, you have that instinct of when's the right time and when it's not the right time. And yeah. I think if you always follow that instinct, uh, you, you won't go wrong. Yeah. Well, great. Well, Anastasia, uh, thank you very much for being a guest on the podcast. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to 15 Minutes. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.